1754, the French and Indian War began when a young George Washington ambushed a group of Frenchmen in the Battle of Jumonville Glen. That would very quickly spread into the worldwide Seven Years' War, fought between Britain and France, over who would become the world's supreme power. The war caused massive changes in the world, and the North American part of that war would lay the seeds for the American Revolution. But one small battle fought after that war, and largely as a result of that war, would make it clear that one period of colonialism had ended in North America, and a new one had begun. The 1763 Battle of Bushy Run deserves to be remembered. The French and Indian War's beginnings can be traced to the previous conflict between France and Great Britain, King George's War, itself related to the wider European War of Austrian Succession. Both conflicts came to an end in 1748. While the European War settled some issues, the Treaties Commission, meant to solve territorial disputes in North America, failed to offer any solutions to control over the Ohio Country. The Ohio Country primarily encompassed the modern states of Ohio, but also the extreme western portion of Pennsylvania and part of Indiana. The Ohio and Allegheny Rivers were of major strategic value as trade routes and offered control of the incredibly lucrative fur trade with Native Americans. The area was claimed by both the French and the British, and both sides were wary of the encroachment of the other. Both had the support of various Native American tribes. British colonists continued to move into the region, and a number of colonial governors were concerned that as long as the French were present, these colonists would not be safe. In 1749, the Ohio Company of Virginia was given land in the Ohio country and tasked with settling 100 families in the region and constructing a fort. A treaty between the British and the local Native Americans in 1752 antagonized the French, and in 1753, a French force built a number of forts throughout the Ohio country, including Fort Duquesne, built at the confluence of the Yakahany and Monongahela rivers, where they become the Ohio River, the future site of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Later, fighting eventually forced the French to abandon Fort Duquesne in 1758, when it was replaced by a larger English fort dubbed Fort Pitt. By that point, the outnumbered French forces, which relied heavily on Native American allies, were essentially ousted from the Ohio country. And by 1760, the French had also been defeated in Canada. It would take another three years for the war to be officially ended with the 1763 Treaty of Paris. The treaty confirmed Canada as a British territory and ceded the land between the Mississippi River and the Appalachian Mountains to the British as well. The war, however, would have even more significant consequences. In the years that preceded the French and Indian War, Native American tribes had some ability to play the various European powers off against each other in an attempt to reach better terms, although they would find ultimately that most European promises would be broken. The loss of France as a land power in the Americas meant that Britain had considerably less incentive to curry favor with Native tribes, who represented less of a threat on their own than they did as a possible ally of the French. Many of the tribes of the land that the French called the Upper Country, land west of Montreal, had been friendly or allied with local and small French settlers for decades. They were surprised in 1763 to learn that the French had been ousted, and that in their place came the British. When British arrived at Fort Detroit, the indigenous people warned that this country was given by God to the Indians. While at another fort, the British were told, although you have conquered the French, you have not yet conquered us. The natives of the Ohio country, tribes like the Delaware, Shawnee, Wyandots, Hurons, and Mingos, had been pushed west by the encroachment of the British and the Iroquois Confederacy. They had reached a separate peace with the British with the Easton Treaty in 1758 and had expected that the British would withdraw from the country after the defeat of the French. Instead, the British began to reinforce their forts. To the Ohio tribes, the action made it clear that the British intended to continue pushing them west. In charge of Indian policy and affairs was General Jeffrey Amherst, Commander-in-Chief of the British Army in North America. Amherst had risen to fame as the leader of the British attack on Louisbourg during the French and Indian War, which would clear the way for the British invasion of Quebec. Amherst did not take the native threat seriously and stationed only 500 men in the West. His agents in the region did not hide their contempt for the native tribes. Amherst himself wrote that his men should try every other method that can serve to extirpate this exorable race the Native Americans. The tribes complained that British agents treated them like dogs. In 1761, Amherst cut back on gifts that had traditionally been given to the tribes by the French, a custom that carried symbolic meaning for the chiefs and that allowed them to convince their people to maintain the alliance. The tribes saw the gifts as part of a greater trade. The gifts were accepted and in return land was shared with the Europeans. Finally, Amherst restricted the sale of guns and gunpowder to the indigenous people, thinking that it would hamstring any armed rebellion. It also made it more difficult for tribesmen to hunt to feed their families and acquire fur for trade. 
Native American tribes were alarmed at what they saw as an inevitable Western expansion on the part of the British and a deterioration in their treatment. They felt that the British did not view them as allies, but as conquered people. In one of his councils, Ottawa Chief Pontiac said, It is important for us, my brothers, that we exterminate from our lands this nation which seeks only to destroy us. You see as well as I that we can no longer supply our needs as we have done from our brothers the French. Therefore, my brothers, we must all swear their destruction and wait no longer. William Johnson, superintendent of Indian Affairs for the Northern Colonies, warned Amherst that his policies would provoke the tribes and wrote that our people in general are ill-calculated to maintain friendship with the Indians. They despise those in peace whom they fear to meet in war. Native Americans hoped to maintain access to additional hunting grounds east of the mountains, a goal that looked increasingly impossible as British forts full of hostile officers held them at bay. While there were many Native leaders, historically the one who had been most prominent was Pontiac. The immediate cause of the war was the impending Treaty of Paris. Pontiac, with around 300 warriors, led a surprise attack on Fort Detroit in May. While the fort was not taken, it inspired a wave of other attacks, and eight forts were eventually captured. Settlers quickly fled as violence spread, and some 550 of them took shelter at Fort Pitt, which was besieged in June. Possibly the most infamous event of the war was when Simeon Ecuyer, for Swiss-born commander of the Fort Pitt garrison, sent out blankets and handkerchiefs exposed to smallpox to the besiegers. The same plan had already been approved by Amherst to Colonel Henry Bouquet, who was preparing a force to relieve the embattled garrison at Fort Pitt. Whether the attempt to infect the American Indians was successful is a historical question. While a smallpox outbreak did affect the tribes at the time, it may have begun before the blankets were given, and the men who accepted the blankets were in good health a month later. Colonel Bouquet was a Swiss mercenary who had served in the French and Indian War and put together a relief force around 500 men, mostly Scots Highlanders from the 42nd Highlander and 77th Highlander regiments, as well as soldiers from the 60th Royal American Regiment. They left from Fort Carlisle and were spotted by Native American scouts well before they reached the fort. He carried with him flour barrels, which he transferred to sacks to be carried by pack horses in order to make his train move more quickly. Bouquet seemed to have expected an attack before he reached the fort, believing it to take place at a narrow pass called the Turtle Creek Defiles. Between Fort Ligonier and Fort Pitt was a post run by Andrew Byerly, a German immigrant. The post was used as a stopover for travel between the two forts. Only a few days before Bouquet arrived at the post, a Native American had arrived at the post. Andrew was briefly away, but his wife with a three-day-old baby was present, and all were warned that they must quit the place so they would all be killed in four days. The family fled and reached the safety of Fort Ligonier. On August 1st, the force attacking Fort Pitt gave up the siege, and historians believe many of them moved to intercept Bouquet's force. On August 4th, Bouquet left from Ligonier, and the following day, about a mile from Bushy Run Post, his advance guard was attacked. The battle was hard fought. Fighting from the trees, the veteran regulars had trouble discerning their enemy's numbers. Bouquet wrote in a report to Amherst, As soon as they were driven from one post, they appeared another till by continual reinforcements they were at last able to surround us. The action then became general, and though we were attacked on every side, and the savages exerted themselves with uncommon resolution, they were constantly repulsed with loss. But, Bouquet added, we also suffered considerably. By the evening of August 5th, Bouquet's forces were surrounded, threatening a repeat of the devastating defeat of Braddock's army in 1755. Bouquet's men constructed a redoubt on nearby Edge Hill, creating an open square with the wounded and supplies at its center. He had lost 60 men, dead or wounded, and he had lost many of his pack horses carrying supplies. Bouquet wrote at the time that he was concerned about the insurmountable difficulties in protecting and transporting our provisions, thanks to the battle. The following morning, the British force was surrounded, and the natives began shouting and yelping to terrify the defenders with the sound of a great multitude of men. The British were tired, but a retreat would mean not only terrible casualties, but likely the loss of Fort Pitt, and possibly the loss of the entire Ohio country, to the native coalition. Bouquet devised a plan to entice them to come closer upon us. He ordered two companies to withdraw, while two other companies filled in the line, enticing the enemy to believe that the first two companies were retreating. It was standard for tribes to wait for weaknesses to appear before attacking in mass to force a rout. But Bouquet's vulnerability was only the bait for his trap. As the native force hurried headlong, the two retreating companies countercharged. The painted Native Americans, Bouquet wrote, resolutely returned fire, but could not stand the irresistible shock of our men, who, rushing in among them, killed many of them and put the rest to flight. The native force, made up of Wyandot, Mingo, and Shawnee tribesmen, broke. Bouquet ordered most of his remaining supplies, which he could not carry, destroyed, and marched the remaining 25 miles to Fort Pitt. Bouquet concluded his report. 
the behavior of the troops on this occasion speaks for itself so strongly that for me to attempt their eulogium would but detract from their merit. The Pennsylvania Gazette, owned by Benjamin Franklin, crowed that Bouquet had totally rotted a very considerable body of Native Americans. Governor James Hamilton of Pennsylvania wrote that the victory was of the utmost consequence to these colonies. Bouquet's victory, however, was nearer than the praise would suggest. He lost 110 men, and the loss of supplies meant he was unable to reestablish any of the other forts. He wrote, I hope we shall be no more disturbed, for if we have another action, we shall hardly be able to carry our own wounded. The Native Americans had captured and destroyed nine forts, killed hundreds of British troops, and at least hundreds of civilians. Thousands had fled their homes. It isn't clear how many men Bouquet faced. Uh, Delaware accounting suggested as few as 99, while Bouquet himself thought he was facing an equal number, perhaps of 400. The number killed is unclear too. Contemporary reports suggest around 60, including several important chiefs. The battle marked a significant change of eras. Without the balancing force of the French, the British leadership often viewed the natives as already subjects of the crown and not as independent nations. The defeat of the Ohio country tribes and the failure of Pontiac's war confirmed this position. The Native Americans were unable to supply themselves with ammunition if the British refused to sell it. For the Pan-Indian Alliance that had been put together by Pontiac, the defeat settled a vital question. Could British colonization be limited? And apparently, it could not. Jane Ockerhausen, writing in Pennsylvania Heritage Magazine, summarized, No matter how the Native Americans negotiated treaties with the colonists, their fate was sealed. Their own eastern homelands and hunting grounds were lost to them. They would continue to be pushed further west. But the immediate consequences of the battle and Pontiac's war went beyond that. In 1763, a royal proclamation, hoping to reduce conflict with Native Americans, and in response to Pontiac, drew a line along the Appalachian Mountains and forbade settlements west of the line despite the fact that some settlement had already been approved. This caused considerable friction with the colonists, who saw westward expansion as a right. The loss of the French as a balancing force also convinced the American colonists that there was less need for a permanent British military presence, and that would be the beginning of serious issues that in the coming years would culminate in the American Revolution. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guide, short snippets of forgotten history. And if you did enjoy, feed the algorithm by making a comment or clicking that like button. If you have suggestions for future episodes, please send those to our suggestions email box. Check out our webpage at thehistoryguide.net. And of course, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can book a special message from the History Guy on Cameo and check out our merchandise at teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes of Forgotten History, all you need to do is subscribe.